Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture as the next installment in the Conversations on Venice lecture series this term. The series brings together architects, educators, curators, and community organizers who are involved in the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale. Each session invites a selection of national pavilions and Biennale contributors, most of whom have connections to the AA, to discuss common themes that span across their installations in Venice and beyond, to address issues of care, mutuality, context, collaboration, and above all, togetherness. Originally scheduled to open in May 2020, the Biennale was postponed by a year to 2021 as a result of COVID-19. The theme chosen by Hashim Sarkis, the curator of this edition of the Biennale, How Will We Live Together, was more prophetic than anyone originally realized, with all participants having an additional year to reflect on not just their contributions, but the role of architecture in a time of crisis. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mani Jay Vergis, and I'm the head of the AA Public Program, but I'm also a co-curator of the British Pavilion at this year's Biennale, and I'm moderating the series together with Francesca Delalio, who has both reviewed this year's Biennale and also taught a summer school unit titled Reporting from Venice to delve deeper into the role of the Biennale within architecture, culture, and discourse. Today's discussion between the curators and architects of the Korean and UAE National Pavilions will address collective endeavors, um, aiming to discuss each pavilion and how they address new and alternative forms of knowledge, but also their involvement in setting up important initiatives like the Curators Collective and a bench in Venice, and the legacy of such an unusual year in the Biennale's history. Um, these initiatives best illustrate the importance of collective endeavors to overcome adversity and to find ways to move forward into an uncertain future together. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion that will follow, especially um, as this week is the final week of the Biennale. And hopefully all of us will, will join Heiwon, who's already in Venice, um, sooner as, rather than later. Um, but to briefly introduce the speakers, uh, Heiwon Shin is the curator of the Korean Pavilion at the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale. Um, she initiated the National Pavilion Curators Collective, or CC, which has grown into a coalition of architects that currently includes the curators of 48 of the National Pavilions participating in the Biennale. Um, based in Seoul, she founded the Architecture Practice Local Design in 2006, and where she's the principal architect. Um, while Al Awar founded Waiwei in 2009 as the principal architect after moving back to the Middle East from Tokyo, um, with interest in natural phenomena, landscape, and formless diagrams of relations, um, Weil has a multidisciplinary approach to design and is always looking to challenge conventional processes to push the boundaries of design. Um, he's currently the curator of the National Pavilion of the UAE for the 17th Architecture Biennale and is winner of the Golden Lion Award. You can read um, longer bios for each of them on the AA website. Um, but before I hand over to Heiwan to begin, just a few notes on the format. Um, so to start, there'll be a short presentation about each pavilion. And then following that, Francesca and I will ask them some questions to start the conversation before opening it up to the audience um, for a wider discussion. Um, if you have questions at any point, um, please feel free to post them in the chat. And during the discussion, if you'd like to actually ask the question yourself, just raise your hand using the function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And um, we can unmute you so you can ask it yourself. Um, if you feel comfortable to do so, it'd be great if you can turn your camera on so we can feel as though we're in the same place despite the series still being held online. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to Heiwan to get us started. Hello. Can you hear? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And I am at the Korean, currently at the Korean Pavilion at the Venice in Venice. And this is um, what we call the Future School. This is the theme of our Korean Pavilion theme that we're we're bringing the school to the space. So we've been having. Uh, different workshops and um, events. And also uh, two days ago, we had a closing performance with An Unmi An and Hei Kyung Kim who were there, <laughs> say hello. <laughs> and you could see that the audience are coming in as I speak and sometimes they speak also, uh, they have their own discussions. So please um, don't mind that. And I will just have a brief introduction. I'll read the text and maybe I'll have a moment to just tour with my other camera and um, just show you those who are not able to come to Venice. So the future school, and we have all, all these uh, contents of our program online. And if I could just share the screen. Yeah, this is good. Okay, okay. perfect. 
So the Future School converts the Korean Pavilion at the 17th International Architecture Exhibition in Venice. And I'm just have to, okay, this is, yes. Um, we are, we are turning this um, Korean pivot into an international incubator for radical thinking, a meeting place to exchange and encounter ideas and projects that actively explores the notion of a building a better future. A global coalition of people, places, concepts, and practices, Future School connects participants and programs across borders. And this is as while fostering diverse mode of engagement. The ultimate aim is to forge a new and multiple solidarities in the face of a current and future challenges, including migration and the growth of the uh, diaspora, the impact of climate change and the increasing speed of social and techno technological change. So you could see from this um, future school online this because where because of the pandemic, we knew that a lot of the participants could not participate physically in Venice. So what he have put all these 50 programs online and you can see some of this curators collectibles the contents here. And you can see how these different programs are linked and connected. Uh, interviews of uh, participants who have created, we call them project directors who have created each programs. And also if you click on each of these programs that they have uploaded, and this is still being ongoing. Um, for instance, we have Future School Lunch Care for Climate. And, and um, you could see all the programs that has been going on and participants being, um, being part of this. And this whole um, platform is ongoing kind of uh, sharing contents and connecting to others at the same time uh, this gets um, automatically pdf into a monthly publications so if you go down to publications and then you down you can download this um, e uh, monthly publication where every month all the contents um, of, of participants uploading and and um, you know ongoing programs and workshops that can automatically uh, put into a monthly um, program. So this is in a way, a, another innovative way of bringing um, the school together. At the same time, there were some uh, programs that was running um, alongside with uh, on a physical space in, in the Korean pavilion, where we ha hosted different um, teams like Global Free Unit and uh, discussing about refugees. Uh, we had uh, performances like An and Me and um, other programs uh, like Slow Signal just had their one day session um, this last Friday. So, and if you, if I just mute this and I, I will change my screen to the other moving phone and I am just kind of stuck here because the, the cat is joining me. In, in the discussion, but I could switch this camera off and then. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. yes. Okay. And can you hear? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm gonna mute this. All right, so you're looking at the Korean pavilion as it said. Sorry, I just have to move on. <laughs> and you, uh, the audience already are looking at um, the lecture as we speak. <laughs> and this is a space where people enter from there. And this is a pinup board that each of the sessions that goes on, they could use this as a pinup. It's part of the exhibit. And uh, a workshop space. So all these materials that we have uh, um, installed here they are temporarily um, being used. And these are all the programs that's being participating. Um, and none of these exhibition, uh, even these uh, carpet, which is part of the um, installation by landscape architect Kim Ayeon, 
who created this um, with hay called uh, Black Meadow. And all this will be uh, dismantled here and be not brought back. And it will be shared with some of the, um, we'll be donating to institutions and people who have been involved in creating this space. So, okay. And we have the kitchen space here where we wanted to also create um, a space for people, uh, students to, or participants to dine, the running water. And so this is almost, it, it, it is a concept of a, a living, almost a domestic environment where uh, people can rest, hold workshops, at the same time, um, create contents and be part of this. Of course, this is not just one layer of thing. This is a um, collaboration or layers of different uh, online media, but also addressing the fact that it's a collaborative layers of um, situation that addresses this pandemic. I'm just gonna bring back to, to this screen here now. Okay. Okay, so this is, is you got the tour of the, the Korean Pavilion. I'm back to my, the other laptop. If I could just share the screen of, just to briefly introduce about the um, Creators Collective. So you can have all the information about how we um, initiated the Creatives Collective um, through this website, creativescollective.org. Um, now we have more than 52 or uh, 50 um, national pavilions, curators involved in creating this platform um, and working together to, in a way of, um, really ha addressing the question, how will we live together? And I thought this was important. I think all of us who were in this um, time where the Biennale was extended another or delayed another year, and we were all questioning uh, what ways can we um, kind of be involved in the Biennale. We could not pretend that um, and, and proceed as how we have been proceeding before, but we have to have a new way of approaching, addressing this question of how will we live together. And the one way of actually activating that is to come together. And all these um, amazing curators who have supported and, and come together to create also um, programs together. And we had, uh, sorry, events such as, um, Midisage and, and you can see the whole process in this video where um, you could see that from the beginning how we got together and then, you know, uh, came this August to first time physically meet in Venice and holding um, different events together. So uh, all of us know this and while maybe later on you could talk about bench in Venice, a bench. And um, yeah, so this is more of an introduction. I'm sure there will be uh, questions and discussions later on. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just stop sharing. Thanks, Ewan. Over to you, Wael. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. And uh, I mean, it's probably the first time I, I share uh, wetland research with, with you and even with the high one in, in, in detail. So, but uh, time is limited. So I'll, I'll try to zap through it. Um, basically, um, wetland, let me just full screen this. So basically, wetland started from a, a, uh, a point where as a practicing architect, you know, there was some desperation from my end to find sustainable building material in the UAE that could help us build in, in, a, in a better 
uh, way than uh, Portland cement uh, itself. I, I, I like to start by this slide where um, it's the most easily cafe in Star Wars. And I see Venice as, as a gathering point of all these different creatures and very similar to the CC video uh, that Haiwan just uh, showed. I mean, this is what Venice is about. It's a place of conversation of people from so many different backgrounds, so many different cult uh, cultural uh, understandings, ideas. So it's a, it's, a, it's a platform that brings us together in a way that allows us to exchange in many uh, different ways. And at, at the same time, wetland, we approached wetland in a similar way, which I'll explain now. So uh, as I stated, you know, as a practicing architect and the climate is at an extreme crisis um, and we're moving from 7 billion population to 10 billion, 11 billion, even some reports say in the next uh, 30 years. So how can we accommodate this growing population while the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation report in 2019 states that we will have to build the equivalent of one New York City every month in the next 40 years to meet this growing population. And the, the amount of emission that is uh, uh, that the architecture and construction industry is responsible for is about 40%, 38% to be precise. And what are, what are these, you know, we have to understand the, what are the details that are causing these uh, emissions. Um, cement is one of the biggest, one of these biggest factors. It's uh, responsible for 8% of global CO2 emission and concrete is the second most consumed material on the planet. And the problem with cement is the conversion of limestone to lime, lime the being the binder or the glue in cement, uh, releases CO2. So it's a chemical reaction more than a, a, a energy intensive process that is causing these high CO2 uh, emissions. For the past 100 years, we've been building in, in very similar ways, 120 years, although so much technology has come at our disposal, but we haven't really re-questioned the materials that we are using, especially cement itself. Uh, it's important to note that one ton of cement releases one ton of CO2. It's very archaic material that if invented today would never be accepted by any approving body. I mean, one ton of uh, CO2 needs one tree, 40 years to absorb that amount. And one ton of cement is equal to a single column. Uh, I mean, imagine on a scale of a building. So if cement was, uh, was uh, compared to a country, it would be the third largest emitter in the world after the USA and China. So the question becomes, uh, you know, wh what is the responsibility of the uh, 21st century architect? I, I'd like to show this also, uh, you know, maybe the 20th century architect was not put in a position where he had to address the climate at the emergency and, and the, the seriousness that we, are, we have to address today. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the, of the letter that, uh, you know, uh, was exchanged between uh, David Chipperfield and uh, Herzog de Meron, where, uh, you know, David asks uh, Herzog, you know, what, what is, you know, what can the architect do in this impeding environmental catastrophe, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, and then Herzog answers, dear David, the answer is nothing. So, you know, the, the question to myself is that, can I, can I say I can do nothing? As a 21st century architect, I feel I can no longer put myself in this position of not addressing this and trying to uh, tackle this problem heads on rather than seeing my, my role as an architect merely as a designer of space and form, but rather also as a, as a, as a uh, problem solver in, in a way and a custodian to the, the planet itself. Many countries, you know, can turn to have turned back to uh, vernacular or sustainable wood, uh, bamboo, etc., in order to build in more sustainable ways. And we have seen that in many uh, pavilions at the Biennale, where they have gone back to build, uh, build with wood or other more sustainable methods than concrete. But in the UAE, the vernacular architecture of the UAE was built from corals. So this is something 
I, do, I have no place to turn back to. Coral architecture is, is, is not possible anymore. The UAE is at a population of 10 million and growing to 20 million in the next 20 years. So anyway, there are no, no more corals to go to. So, you know, we started looking at how can we solve the problem of concrete and, or cement, you know, and if, if, it, if we need to solve the problem, then we need to find an alternative binder other than lime. So it is a geological problem. So we had to go back and look at the earth and geology to try to find another binder. So once we started scouting the geography of the UAE, we quickly stumbled upon the subhas of the UAE that compose 5% of the local geography. And we were captivated and, you know, by the cementitious crust that definitely has a binder that is gluing all these materials together. So we started looking and researching at what could this binder be. And I must say that the subhas or the salt flats, it's an Arabic word, but it's in the English dictionary meaning salt flats, is not only a local phenomenon in the UAE, but a global phenomenon. So there are salt flats in Ethiopia, Tunisia, etc. Also, we came to learn that there was vernacular architecture produced from salt flats or subha sections. And uh, one perfect example is Siwa, which is on the border of uh, Libya, but in Egypt itself, where the town has been standing up for 800, 900 years, all built from salt blocks. Even the uh, Star Wars episode, the, the first uh, episode is the, 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 the architecture you see here is not a makeshift stage set. Huh? This is real architecture that is built from the salt flats of uh, Tunisia. So salt flats are actually natural carbon sinks that absorb CO2. One square meter of salt flat absorbs more CO2 than one square meter of rainforest. So these are natural living environments that we learned from. And what we came to learn from uh, our collaboration with the American University of Sharjah, specifically in the research of salt flats, is that the, the binding agent in this uh, uh, that's keeping these minerals together is magnesium oxide, MGO. But we could not promote the extraction of salt flats. So we had to see where can we source MGO other than from the salt flats. And the answer lied in the desalination, the, re the reject brine of desalination. The UAE is the third largest desalinator. The MENA region, which includes uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, etc., is responsible, is responsible for 48% of global desalination. So we have an abundance of this reject brine that has uh, high amounts of magnesium oxide that is currently being dumped back into the Arabian Gulf, causing environmental disasters in the sea. Uh, the UAE alone throws back the equivalent of 4,800 Olympic sized swimming pools of reject brine into the Arabian Gulf. So, we found this industrial waste material that we could tap into to try to see and start experimenting on how we could produce architecture or a cementitious material, let's say, from this reject brine. So the first collaboration, we had numerous, three main collaborations with universities. The first was with the American University of Sharjah, the biochemistry engineering lab. So here you can see we were completely out of our typical comfort zones as architects and designers and stepping into uh, laboratories. So the first experiments were mainly, you know, preliminary experiments where we just submerged fabrics and grew into uh, reject brine, growing crystals, you know, pr uh, producing architecture, uh, producing material here, I would say that is soluble. So it's, a, a temporary material here. So, but we started looking that, you know, maybe we could look at not only structure, but material finishes or permanent uh, temporary structures that could offer uh, emergency shelters, etc., uh, uh, rather than just being uh, permanent structures. But we wanted to push the research uh, further and further. And the second collaboration was with NYU Abu Dhabi, the Advanced Material Research Lab, where we uh, actually 
uh, zapping through, we had finally were able to produce a cement material that it has magnesium oxide as its base, a salt uh, base that is uh, uh, that performs to the same compressive strength as Portland cement and is a per can offer permanent structures. They are insoluble materials, so these materials no longer dissolve in water. Finally, you know, coming after you know during this you know this research still ongoing, we had to present something in Venice. So the collaboration came with Tokyo University to produce the first prototype, or let's say Act One, which uh, in this prototype, we, were, we did not only want to question modern material, but the modern production of space in that sense. So it was kind of an homage to the vernacular architecture of the UAE from corals, and at, at the same time, the antithesis of modern architecture, which means the, the, we uh, told the students, this first prototype was done by students in Tokyo University to imagine corals, draw them by hand into sand. So there's no specific drawing, but rather a, a procedure manual. Um, and then we would cast it with the cementitious material and then they would assemble it together. But this assembly, you know, although very uh, random, uh, the, a big uh, a collaboration with the Obuchi Sons uh, Laboratory in Tokyo University, which is digital fabrication lab, where you can see the students wearing these devices in their hands. These are reprogrammed from the gaming industry, which actually guide the builder into the model form of a projection of a hologram onto the space. It's quite complicated. You can see the scanners here uh, on the scaffolding that actually project a hologram of the form. So as an architect, I would only decide the form, but I cannot decide what is within the form and how things are assembled within the form. That is only decided amongst conversation between the builders themselves. So they will decide that. And then you see the guy on top of the ladder holding, holding like a gun-like device. So that then we scan these pieces and we have like an as-built model that can be structurally calculated at the end and allow, you know, and proves the stability of the structure. So just quickly going on, then we produce another prototype in the uh, lab in Dubai. And you see here, the modules are very different because the perception of what a coral looks like changes from culture to culture or from person to person. And then they would draw things differently. Uh, uh, this is an image of the material research. Finally, in the, also in Venice, we exhibit large format photos taken by Farah Al-Qasimi, uh, Emirati artist based in uh, New York, where she captures the tension between, you know, modernization and, and uh, man, you know, the, the building and the cable wires, et cetera, and the natural environment, the competition between the two. Uh, and the structure we built in Venice is made from 2,400 units that are all Hand, hand molded and casted and assembled uh, on site. The whole thing was done in Venice. We shipped nothing from the UAE. So the builders in Venice, they came and uh, uh, did their own module forms uh, at the Viennale. So I moved to a bench in Venice. Uh, a bench in Venice is a, is a collaboration with the Curators Collective. And uh, I must say this, uh, this project was the, the uh, initiated by Hai Wun and a conversation she had with, the, with Japan and I think Germany, where they were in conversation of, uh, of uh, putting a common bench in between them as a, in the public space, uh, as you know, addressing the, the issue after the pandemic of people gathering, coming together, bringing them together. Uh, at the same time, in the, in the uh, Curators Collective, I believe I was in a group where, you know, the first round was in the group. And uh, I think Madi was in that group. Also, uh, Japan was in that group uh, and others. I mean, and uh, we were talking about material recycling waste produced by the Biennale. And the idea was, OK, why don't we start to create this log sheet where we ask all the different pavilions to, to tell us of what, is left over from their uh, building process. So we created the log sheet and uh, everyone filled in the, uh, the requirements. 
We then presented this uh, uh, to, to the president of La Biennale in the beginning, and it was not very well perceived because of COVID, actually. So who is responsible for the bench? How do we sanitize it? How do we, you know, it is a responsibility that someone, but we did not give up. We kept it going. And um, finally, we decided uh, through a collect as a collective that we will launch this as a international student open call competition. And the brief was written and generously translated into six languages, I believe. So we had it translate, each curator translated. So we had it in Polish and Russian and Japanese and Korean in English. So, uh, and we, we, we sent the, the call out and we received uh, 136 entries at the end. And it was only a three, three week uh, period. Uh, there were 353 responses, actually. So 353 registered to submit, but we only received 136. And uh, you can see here the, the array of, or the, you know, how many, how diverse uh, the, the uh, submissions were. And that's what I found very, very interesting and intriguing that we received, you know, submissions from, so many countries. It was incredible that from India, Australia, Japan, you can read them there. I mean, it was incredible how uh, diverse it was. And I think that was a reflection of the curators collective and I, our diversity and collective efforts that we were able to reach such a, a wide uh, audience. Then finally, we put together a jury from the curators as well as uh, Vocht uh, Landscape, which was in the uh, 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 international participants, but Gunther Vogt uh, generously donated 2,000 of the soil uh, blocks that were used to produce their uh, pavilion. And uh, this is the, uh, the identity of a bench in Venice. So we, we created a, a nice identity. It had its own uh, thing. These are, this is a photo of the winning, one of the winning schemes that was uh, built and put in the UAE pavilion. And these are the two students that won. They actually visited us in Venice and uh, we uh, registered them as interns and gave them a monthly pass also to give them a lot of time to tour the, uh, the uh, Biennale. And we, ended, we also, for the Mendisage events as, as a collective, we were uh, able to uh, represent uh, print and display all 136 submissions on the, on the walls and the rear walls of the UAE pavilion. And this is the, the, the winning scheme that is uh, on display at the hosted by the Spanish pavilion. And this, you can see Alex and Rafael uh, here. And then on the, the image on the right is one of the students actually he visited, he was able to visit and uh, uh, we had a nice conversation and he saw the bench and was very happy about it. And finally, the third bench is on display at the Japanese pavilion. I unfortunately don't have good photos of this, but I'm curious. I'll be arriving to Venice tonight to see it tomorrow because this, this bench is supposed to weather and react to climate and the movement of people. It's made from the soil bricks that were donated by Vogt Landscape. So I'm curious to see what's happened to this bench uh, tomorrow. Uh, thank you. That's that's all. Thank you um, both well and and you know, Avon. Um, I mean, it's it's very interesting to see um, both presentations and also like to kind of look at both presentation under the the lens of today, which is this idea of collective endeavor. But um, I think that there is, uh, I have to say that there, are, there is a lot of like uh, connection between the two pavilions. Um, I like this idea also what you were, when you were talking well about um, talking about Venice as a gathering point, but also imagining this the pavilion too as a gathering point, which I see a sort of resonance also in, in the way the Korean pavilion is kind of um, arranged, uh, let's say together with, of course, the presence of the kitchen and the presence of this big carpet as this kind of big space where we can gather together. 
but also I like the fact, um, but I, I think it's really interesting in seeing the two presentations together because both of you, I think, look, of course, and they pro problematize the future and the, the presence and our role as architect towards uh, the, the kind of future of, of, um, of our discipline, but also within, within the world, of course, at large. But how you tackle this from com two completely different points. Like on one hand, of course, you have hey one that looks at the, the kind of central aspect of education and how can education really like engage in a discussion that really question the future of our discipline and of course of education within the kind of the, the, as part of our this is an active part of our discipline. And on the other hand, of course, instead you well, we're, we're looking at the more practical aspect of it, right? Like really as, like also to redefine what does it mean to practice architecture too? Like in both ways, there is a sort of attempt to redefine two crucial aspects of our, of our profession, which I think are, they need a change. They are really like, now we are really crossing a moment in our discipline in which we need to, take a stand and I really like decide that we need to make a little move, even, even a subtle move, but to make a little change in this. Like, so practicing doesn't necessarily mean to go out there and do a design project of a, of a building, but really also means to kind of experiment with the land and with the kind of what does it mean materials in architecture? What does it mean to produce a material in architecture? And on the other hand, I think, Education, this idea of the exploring radical pedagogies, I think, is extremely interesting. It's something that goes on since quite a while, but of course, it's something that it's so hard to to kind of, you know, um, apply in in within the within the boundaries of academia. And I think that that that's the power, I think, of the platform of of the Biennale and the exhibition in general as a kind of very important place where we kind of bring up this question, like bring forward this question and really put them out there in, in a, as a sort of topic of discussion. And I really like how, how both of both of the, um, the pavilion and both research, I think also in a very simplified way, probably I'm, I'm presenting this and I'm, I'm kind of explaining this, but they really borrow from the past and kind of intervene in the present and question the future. And I think it's, this is also another very interesting kind of common ground between, between the two pavilions. As for, um, I think one of the things that I have to say, uh, probably just as a, we are kind of tackling two, two things, but I think they are kind of also a bit intertwined, which is this idea of also of the curator collective, which, I have to say, it's one of the most fascinating things that ever happened in a Biennale, I have to say. Uh, it's just because I think that the emphasis of the value of the Biennale has been completely flipped. So usually the Biennale has always been considered like the emphasis on the, kind, the weight, you know, the expectation was always sitting before the exhibition. So we were kind of driven towards the opening, this big one, big event, but everyone may be, especially in the, in the architecture world or in the art world, gathering together in this sort of gathering point, as you said, well, but then, you know, that was it. What the Curators Collective does, it just flipped that emphasis and really like allow us to kind of look at the Biennale as a, as a con constant kind of entity that keeps changes according to the different kind of inputs that it receives. And I think that that's, something extremely powerful that I'm very optimistic about. I mean, I've lived in Venice for so long. I kind of, I saw quite a few, quite a few Biennale and I have to say that this is the first time I think there is a really a, a very inter interesting potential discussion that can be brought forward and can be really like a rise from, from this approach. Um, I have, um, so after this kind of big <laughs> uh, kind of um, sort of, um, uh, kind of wrap up of, of both both intervention. I have uh, maybe um, a question that starts perhaps also for for you, Yvonne. Um, and I'm and I'm kind of curious um, to see. Well, maybe no. I start with another question, which is actually for for both of you. And I'm kind of curious because both of you, of course, presented the research, uh, but then of course this research has to be translated into an installation into a pavilion. 
And as usual with any installation, a bit like the, the kind of role of the audience is quite important. I'm wondering how both of you have has considered a bit like the audience for both topics that are extremely architectural, but are very vital to be understood by, by, by a public, by an audience that is not just an architectural audience. So I'm wondering how do you did you think about the audience as part of your process of, of curatorship, let's say, of the pavilion. And thank you. <laughs> Should I start? Yeah. And you can see that already even this uh, talk is being part of uh, the future school, although you could see that the audience, they would grasp uh, whatever that interest you know, interest them. As we know, we are familiar that in the Biennale, even myself, there's so much content and things to see. It's very difficult. I mean, maybe I would stay maybe two, two, three minutes in each of the, you know, sometimes longer, but first visit, it would be um, a short visit to all the, to scanning all the, the national pavilions and all the main exhibitions and so on. So in a way, I think there is an expectation for the audience to fully engage, but at the same time, I'm using this uh, Biennale to also incubate um, participants who are also, this is a, maybe a, one of the, a, a, another new way of approaching where we have more than 200 participants or exhibitors in, in the Korean pavilion uh, beyond just the, within the Korean um, architecture community, but with architects, theorists, artists, uh, musician, and uh, even the team in the, what we call, who are called the guards, uh, the Dawsons, they are part of the exhibitors. Uh, we call them Venetian uh, team. So we have Lagoon Dialogues that sort of discusses about the, the limits of the Biennale and the, the locality of the situation, which became so important during the time when we, none of us could come to Venice. All the shipment has been done. The container was sitting here for more than a year uh, fermenting. And uh, even the, the staging of these, all these, uh, the paper pudding, everything had to be uh, coordinated with the contractors here and the team here. So even when we were every week in the Zoom sessions, we wanted them to install a, a vase that was an ONGI project and we had to like move our, our, our body, like could you slightly move towards the left, you know? So this collaboration was so important. And I think the um, um, audience can experience that through the uh, footage of the whole process. So that's important. And that's why we, we initially had not um, planned to have the online future school online but we have created with the time given uh, uh, online content that can be shared also beyond the space of the Korean pavilion I think that uh, also is um, evident uh, throughout the process of the CC where the process of um, a meeting and everything can be shared within us and we are also part of the participants of making the Biennale at the uh, national pavilion of the uae the way we tackled it i mean the amount of inf the research we had was we had vast information a lot of information especially information in chemistry biochemistry advanced material research but we had to make a very conscious decision on what we show and what we exhibit in 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 an exhibition that has you know uh, 60 countries was it and 167 international participants you know and people get tickets they have two days one day arsenali one day jardine you have to zap through so uh, it was important just to give a first impression that allows one to leave with a question and that was really important i mean the whole thing was us asking questions to ourselves and then uh, then how can we let the, the visitor leave with a, with a certain question in his mind or, or you know, that, that, then that, that he can take home and think more about and probably he can then, if he's interested to go into further online research, there's a lot of other videos and content about the research online. 
so that was, you know, in a way, one of the crucial ways of editing the design of the exhibition it's, it's, uh, itself. Uh, the participant, the the uh, let's say the uh, visitors are not so much um, active participants within our exhibition, you know, but they can. We have an audio file also that uh, they can uh, hear. So there is it, it plays on different senses. So you have the sound of listening to something, and then you have the touching factor because it's all about material. Uh, some people were licking the salt blocks. Actually, we we. I was sent a few uh, messages from the interns saying, is it dangerous? They just licked the salt block. And I was like, no, it's not dangerous. It's only, you know, salts of different kinds. So, so it's probably just engaging with the visitors on the, sen the different sensory uh, uh, part uh, experiences. Sorry, my, the English words are not perfect with me so uh, that's how we engaged with the uh, with the visitors plus the large format photos of farah that just throw you into a a context you know in directly immediately throw you into a certain uh, context and uh, the white tiles was a conscious decision to put you into a lab space so rather than displaying all these formulas you get the feel oh i'm in a lab space by this just simple white tiling and fluorescent light. So the light was this kind of very ne neutral, white, neo-fluorescent uh, light. But uh, what we have uh, also interesting in the pavilion is the, uh, is we don't have docents like the uh, Korean pavilion. The Korean pavilion have docents that I believe have been with them for seven, eight years, which is amazing. They keep the pavilion running. Uh, on the contrary, the UAE has uh, a program of interns, 21 interns yearly that go from the UAE uh, in groups of three and each stay for one month uh, in the pavilion and they take care of the pavilion and they tour the guests, etc. the pavilion. And then they are, uh, they are also introduced to the school in Venice uh, to do a workshop during that one month stay. So there's this kind of exchange program uh, through students, which I think is fascinating because a lot of these students come back and, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, they learn a lot. I mean, a lot of them have not, you know, really, uh, you know, Dubai UAE is, is connected to the world, but it's also very much a, uh, a very safe place and protects children, uh, students in a way where this throws them into a European city where they have to interact with others. Many have been alone for the first time uh, living there for a month. Um, that, basically, that's it. I hope it makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, maybe just to pick up, I mean, there's a question in the chat, but, but before we get to that, I wanted to ask a question about something that you mentioned in your presentation, Well, about the role of the architect in the 21st century. But I think to both of you, um, obviously, as both architects and curators, you chose to um, really use the pavilion as a platform for collaboration and different forms of collaboration, whether that's through the programming of the future school or the many different research collaborations that you presented while well that led to the invention of this, this kind of new building material as a concrete alternative. And I was just curious as to like how you each saw the role of the architect evolving, not just um, as a form of practice, but also as a form of rethinking how we approach the commission of a pavilion in Venice, like in the past, you know, an architecture practice would probably just put things on display that talk about their work um, or would talk about like uh, they would just kind of exhibit research. But actually your, your pavilions are really kind of platforms for new forms of knowledge and for collaboration. And that's kind of then been extended out even further in terms of the initiatives that you've each set up. Um, kind of through the Curators Collective. So I just wanted to hear each of you maybe reflect a bit on the role of the architect, both in the context of the Biennale, but then also in the wider context of practice. I don't know, well, maybe you want to start this time? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is, it's a very good question because it's a question I ask myself every day, you know, as a practicing architect, I cannot accept uh, you know, uh, allowing myself to fall into a certain pattern of design or a certain habit of design. And then, you know, it just, I think 
there's then no more development of one's uh, ideas or uh, in that sense. I don't see architecture as a, as a uh, stagnant thing, but very a very mobile profession or a moving profession that has to always re-question, re-question. And especially, you know, uh, we, we have, as I said, we have so many different cultures coming together today. The new world is very different from the old world. You know, the old world where... Uh, very monotonous, maybe cities were very quite monotonous. You know, today they are no longer monotonous. There's so so many different people f- with different perceptions and different food habits, different etc. So how how do you, you know how do you address that in in designing programming spaces etc. So the role of the architect today has changed has been developing is constantly changing. Um, and that is where you know I, 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 I see that the 21st century architect can no longer adopt the methods of the 20th century architect. You know, the 20th century architect, I have a very clear image of who or she is, you know. And unfortunately, it's that image. I don't want to be that image, you know. And I think a lot of the problems we have today are a result of certain methods that were adopted in the 20th century, not only in architecture, even in agriculture, you know, or the, or even in medicine. But today, you know, that's why we, you know, there was this, uh, you know, going back kind of to, to reset the system in order to reset the system as a 20, you know, as today, how do I reset? You know, you have to go back, see, okay, if I go back, how can I, learn from the past somehow the vernacular but we have amazing technology at our hands today that we need to use in a in a positive way how can we use that and apply it to to to, you know methods that we believe are are um, let's say more sustainable or more acceptable in today's world and then i think we can start moving forward again it's kind of creating new systems. We have systems, those systems don't work. So we need to make new systems. I completely agree also with Well, And I think I'm myself a, a practicing architect. I have great respect to um, the practice and building um, um, in, in the traditional sense of architecture, but I think the way that we approach uh, the Korean Pavilion as a future school, uh, it's not just about dealing with education, it's really about we wanted to open, even this was initiated, the curatorial direction was initiated before the pandemic, and we thought we will, from the p- future school in the Korean Pavilion, we would open up a new day. So this is a, a, an, an active engaging saying, okay, we're going to address uh, the question of how will we live together? Um, we don't have an answer. It's, it's, I, I, we didn't want to provide answers, but we wanted to um, have these six months to really see how can we do that? And then also how, what are the, uh, the aspects of, what we're facing, which is with the climate, with the migration, with innovation, um, coming together, creating coalition, working together and see how we go from here. It's really about um, uh, planting seed and also raising questions and different ways of engaging. I, I don't think I would have done it this way if the over, the Hashim Sarkis's directors um, main theme wasn't uh, how will it live together. So that's, I think this is a way that uh, in every situation uh, with different contexts and different roles that we play, we have different also ways of engaging and we, and what point I am in the, on the, in front of the drawing board, drawing details and, you know, figuring out how things go uh, in, in construction. But at the other side, it is, we're engaged in it. We are in, in, in a social context where we have to engage in different ways to um, 
to be involved in in this world together. So this is a way of of doing this, and I hope that um, through, throughout this exhibition that people have um, had an, a, a new um, hope and and another um, assignments that they would carry on from this. Great, thank you both. I think that's a really important point about about like ways in which we have to move forward from from this moment in in time. Um, maybe Francesca, should I ask the question in the chat? Yeah. Um, so there's a question specific, so specifically, I guess, about um, the material research that you did in the UAE Pavilion, um, and was they were wondering whether this could be used like in areas affected by earthquakes and challenging weather conditions. And they used like Norcia, Italy as an example. Um, and uh, Valeria who asked the question says that she saw many temporary housing solutions um, that were built for residents, but she wasn't sure of like what materials, but she thought like wood and shipping containers and many other like kind of basic use materials were used. And like, maybe it's a question about like where you see the application of these materials going forward well. Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, uh, again, the 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 uh, the question I raise at the end of the exhibition is that can industrial waste be the future or the new vernacular? You know, like the UAE where we have no vernacular because the vernacular is coral. So can we start seeing that waste produced by cities is a vernacular to that city? So then we can probably use that as a, as a building, uh, start using that as a building material. So coming from here, I would say, you know, what, what, we, are pro we, are, what we are proposing in this material is not a, 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 a worldwide scale product, not at all. We are saying that this material works in the countries that desalinate and have abundance of reject brine. So we saw that reject brine as a, as a, as a waste that is, available in our city, in our country, and that we can tap into it to produce uh, uh, architecture. Uh, it could be in uh, temporary formats, uh, such as uh, emergency shelters. As I mentioned in my presentation, you know, it could be as quick as uh, using the brine itself to uh, uh, crystallize uh, fabrics. And we did a kind of like a tent-like structure also. It's very easy actually to do tent-like structures that crystallize and they can uh, be emergency shelters for a few months uh, and would work very well. Or it could be pushed further to become permanent structures that, uh, you know, don't, uh, uh, don't, you know, don't dissolve with, uh, with the humidity, et cetera. Um, you know, I was lucky enough uh, that Hai Won, on her way to Venice, uh, passed through Dubai and spent the day with me. And I took her on a tour and she saw two of my projects. That was <laughs> 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 and, and actually, one of the projects I took her to was uh, also made, built from shipping containers, 84 shipping containers. And the reason for that is because it's, again, a, a, an abundant material material that is available in Dubai. Dubai is one of the largest shipping ports in the world. So there's a lot of discarded shipping containers. So what we did is we took 84 of them, refurbished them and did a, a temporary uh, space next to Dubai Design District actually. And, uh, and you know, it, it works very well because those, but I don't know if a country doesn't have any shipping containers, I wouldn't be shipping containers there in order to use them for architectural solutions. You have to find local uh, solutions. It could not be global. The idea of global, I think, is, that, is an idea of the 20th century, and we should discard that immediately and start thinking from local. Thank you, Will. I, I, oh, I don't know whether, I, I think that pretty much um, was an interesting answer to you, Valeria. I don't know if you want to add something, Valeria, feel free to come forward. Um, there is another question, actually. Um, it's 
Well, it's an interesting one. Um, I might just ask one thing to to a one before, if that's okay, uh, Steph. Um, it's, um, I mean, it's the I'm, I'm kind of intrigued, and I like the fact that you before a one said that it's the, the Korean Pavilion is not necessarily about education, right? Like in a mere, in a strict sense of its meaning, but it really also is a way to kind of also a bit challenge, challenge the boundary of what education means. What does it mean to be educated, to have an architectural education? What does it mean, an architectural education? And what, how does that impact? Of course, therefore, so the, the, the profession itself. And I like also the fact that somehow I see a, a sort of connection also with the Curators Collective and about the fact that Curators Collective also invites and opens up towards students, which is one of has been one of the most the biggest weaknesses, I think, of the Biennale in the past, that is sort of like the difficulty somehow to bridge with, with academia. And um, Instead, like I think that this year, and also I think that Manager, you put this very beautifully before, but I, I really like the fact that both pavilions are investing in this and really looking at the pavilion, not just as a mere exhibition that is finite, that sits there for like four or five months until the Biennale closes, but it really like uses that as a platform to kind of develop knowledge, construct knowledge, share knowledge and bridges, of course, like the, the, the kind of cultural production of two countries that really like can come together in Venice, but also have, of course, like his own, um, his own history. And I, I really like this, the, the sort of like beautiful dialogue that creates between, between countries. And I have this, I, I was wondering, since I saw the pavilion the first time, I really thought it was, it was a, an extremely beautiful pavilion for, for two reasons. And one, it's maybe it's my own interpretation. So take this with a pinch of salt. But like, of course, um, on one hand, I had this feeling, which was also the reason why I asked you, I started with this question about the audience. But I had this feeling that, and correct me if I'm wrong, one that your the, the Korean pavilion is really mainly, ref, like it addresses to the, the, the residents of the pavilion, the people that live, that dwell in the pavilion, let's say more so than the audience itself, right? Like is interested in constructing something within a community that people then come, pass by, sit and participate in. But I think that that's such a strong message that the pavilion does and gives towards like an ad, let's say in this sort of in a new possible connotation of exhibiting architecture. It's not something that is as purely static, but it's something that is constantly in progress and constantly evolved and changed. And audience becomes a participatory kind of agent in this sort of stage, let's say, of, of constructing common knowledge, let's say, which I, I find it extremely um, powerful in that sense. So my question is in the sense, like, how do you think how, how do you think that education can really help also, or like, or how do you think that education and exhibition, exhibiting architecture can influence each other in, in, in a possible future? And then how can we really like develop a new way of exhibiting architecture, which I think also connects a bit to manager's question from before. Sorry, Sorry, you want to unmute. <laughs> Sorry, um, we just had a temporary Wi-Fi situation, but um, thank you so much. Hello? Okay. So some of it is freezing. Okay, I'm going to... We can hear you. The, the Venice, uh, we had another line of connection here, but um, sometimes it freezes. So maybe um, this one is working. All right, this is the live situation. <laughs> and I'm back. So thank you so much for um, having uh, to hear and, and hearing your reflection in, in the Korean Pavilion. I definitely, uh, what, 
I wanted to say that this, this exhibition is not about education. So that's, that's what I was saying. But it, of course, it indirectly wanted to um, create uh, discussions and, and questioning about current education. One thing that I wanted to um, show also here is that we cannot be in a silo especially in the education of architecture, where we think that we are the experts and all the people that are teaching the professors, um, that we come into a situation where um, that we don't engage in, in the real community close to us and that we kind of bring up uh, also educate students with an attitude that we are in, in a way superior. Um, and I think one of the ways of um, kind of going away from that siloed situation is to say, uh, what, who, are, who are we as, as um, educators and who are we as students? And maybe there isn't a boundary as, uh, that is um, giving that role. So every situation, even the community, even the people who, the, who are running the facility, they are as uh, much as part of the school as the experts or the um, teachers or the educators. So that's one of the, the uh, message that, that maybe uh, from this kind of environment that provides and also in, through the online. And I think this uh, engaging with the, um, the local also it, to Venice is important. And I, we wanted to do that even from a sing, very small um, engaging with the, the uh, printer here that the, our actually every publication is online, but whatever that we printed has had be printed from the Venice uh, printer that, that it's then shipped to the globally if they, they require. And also the team here, um, the Venetian team who are engaged, engaged in the dialogues, of course, they're, I need like all day, whole day, I'm not doing justice to all the participants who are participating in the future school to explain what all the layers of different engagements that people have. But um, as noting for the Venetian team, um, they're working here, but uh, it raises questions uh, also in terms of the rooftop that we never um, used it as part of the exhibit, exhibiting space. And we thought, oh, it would be great to be part of um, the school that where students could be also up in, up in the, um, the roof and having lunch or breaks. But it was actually a, a sacred space also for the Venetian team who were working here. And uh, that raises, raised questions like, okay, we need to open up after three where they have their own space. It's almost like a breakout space, resting space for the, the workers. So this um, different um, layers of rethinking about who are, who are we as educators? Who are we as um, people who think that they are the experts of pedagogy? But at the same time, all this, we know that it has to be quite an open system where everybody can engage in making a school. That's, that's great. I'm sorry, I'm just conscious of time. So maybe I'll fold Steph's question in with a kind of um, a, 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 another question. So uh, Steph has asked, she's first of all, thanked both of you for amazing talks. And um, the question is, are there any surprisingly difficult or easy things you found in your pursuit um, of collective endeavors? And I guess, um, you know, while we've had, well, well, both of you have discussed um, and and formulated it quite, um, I guess, in an inspiring way to talk about the role of the architect and the need to change the systems that exist and how we operate to bring people together. There are obviously challenges in terms of extending the network and you know managing so many different collaborators and and audiences in different ways. So it'd be great to hear you talk about the. The, the, the advantages, but also the challenges maybe of that. But then I think maybe to end, it would also be nice to hear both if you reflect on kind of what's next for both of these projects as Venice comes to a close on Sunday, um, where will the future school and I guess all of this incredible material research from the UAE Pavilion, like where will that be applied um, as we kind of go forward beyond Venice? I don't know, whichever one, if you want to start. Sure. Um... Of course, I mean, um, 
I mean, the challenge is, is the uncertainty. I think that's, you know, you just have to be um, kind of at ease being outside your comfort zone. You know, a lot of the work we did is in, labora- in, in laboratories of biochemistry where I really don't know much, but, you know, I'm willing to, to step into those territories and try to understand probably I don't understand in full detail, but at least to dialogue with these experts on where we believe and in the direction in which we believe the research should go. And at some point, you know, I was telling the national pavilion, we'll put this up in Venice, these prototypes. We, we, this was the first time we built something with 2,400 pieces of that scale. We only had built partial wall sections of 300, 350 units, you know? And I was always saying, you know, if it collapses, just collapses. What can I do? We'll keep it collapsed and it'll open as a collapsed structure. I mean, so you have to, you have to kind of agree that failure is part of this process and, and failure is not failure. Yeah. Failure means that you are in process of developing. So it, it, this is how you should see it. And, and this is where I think the challenges come because we're not used to thinking that way. You know, we're used to thinking in our pragmatic ways of, you know, everything pre-planned, especially as architects, you know, this prototype has no drawing. There's no drawing. I mean, there's 2,400 units put together by six people talking to, together. So imagine the stress of, you know, not seeing the outcome physically we as architects draw to scale of one to five obsessed and we will comment on the drawing if it is not 100 percent to our liking but this is where we need to challenge ourselves and start to accept collective endeavors and collective work means that we have to share our knowledge and we have to converse with one another to build better futures and it's not my way only and this is where i think previous you know the old architect you know, was the architect, you know, the only architect. Anyway, so that's, um, that's my say on that. Regarding uh, the way forward, I'm, I'm in Paris now in a hotel room. I have to rush soon to the airport to catch a flight to Venice. Um, I presented Wetland at UNESCO, and we are in serious conversations with global partners, countries, in order to... Uh, support in the funding and the research. Um, so we see this as, as something ongoing. So Venice was only a pit stop, was a stopping point within this body of work. And uh, it was successful in Venice. So that gave us a lot of more credibility to really get people listening more seriously. Uh, that, that kind of is not a good thing because why wouldn't they listen seriously without that credibility of winning the golden line? But, you know, unfortunately, when you have a trophy, people look at you differently. So, but we're taking advantage of that to, to capitalize on, on uh, bringing more support into the research. Thank you. Mm. I will. Um, and- The, the, the Future School is part of the Venice Biennale exhibition, which ends next week. <laughs> so so that, that gives, it's not a school that you have to continue for 100 years. Um, but, but in another way, I, I hope that all these uh, programs that, that people have participated, somehow they benefited, they gained um, and, and, and be supported uh, by this uh, future school. And, and some of it's been created because of, of, of this um, um, exhibition. So that continuously that people who are already connected through this will create another um, programs and, and schools and alternative schooling and other uh, progressive uh, uh, platforms where people engage in new ways of thinking and engaging. So that's my hope. And I think for me, I need a time of reflection and quiet time. I'll be disconnecting from everything. No, no, no. But um, 
But for the Creators Collective, I think what is great is that it's not just one person deciding, it's, it's a collective um, endeavor and we definitely will be, um, be discussing and, and also find a way, ways of um, delivering this to the next, probably in the architecture um, biennale that this doesn't end here. It, this spirit of collaboration and mutual respect and coming together continues to the next um, series of biennales coming. And thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you for, <laughs> that's very interesting. I mean, I really hope that the Curator Collective is gonna, it's gonna keep inform, keep informing, I think at least the future Biennales. And it really like, I, I think it's it's a quite, quite an important moment this Biennale this year. So hopefully, um, that hopefully really is gonna change a, a bit, a lot of tiny details of, of that institution quite long, quite old institution, I think that is. Um, but thank you very much for... Yeah, thank you both so much for um, not just these amazing presentations, but really creating these generous platforms, both through your pavilions, but also through the initiatives you set up that fills us with hope that there is a way forward with to leave the singular architect behind and to, to really create a much more collaborative profession and um, achieve so much more um, through these platforms than what we've been able to do previously. So yeah, um, and yeah, long may the Curators Collective continue. Anyway, thank you both and looking yeah. forward to seeing you later this week. Yes, yes looking coming? forward to <laughs>